500 years ago, this is what type looked like. Until a printer named Aldus Minucius popularized Roman type and introduced the first italic typeface. He also made books smaller, which made them cheaper and more portable. You didn't have to be wealthy to learn, and books were easier to share. 300 years ago, you couldn't find type that was the same size from type foundry to type foundry. Type sizes varied by geographic region, too, until Pierre Simon Fournier implemented Parisian standards for sizing type. Standards that had been decreed but not observed for 14 years. His decisions about sizing type were adopted in France and in the Netherlands. But uh, more importantly, he inspired similar broader movements around the world. And just 100 years ago, visual vocabulary of de Stiel was brand new. Compositions like these were radical. With sans serif typography and geometric forms, Theo van Dosberg challenged our ideas of beauty and our understanding of how readers emotionally digest graphic design. A new format in the young medium. The power of standards and their implementation. Design decisions that challenge the status quo. These are three points of light in a universe of typographic history that is full of good taste, dedication to our craft, and innovative thinking. And this is our heritage. These are just some stories. We have our own stories, too, like the one we're all living through right now, graphic design's transition to the web. The web is the best place for text. Unlike a printed artifact, text at a URL can be copied and translated and searched, linked to other content, it's convenient, it's accessible. The web is the best place for text. And yet, as I stand here, we're doing things with text that would have been unthinkable to our predecessors, taking it outside of its intended, meaningful, planned context, putting it in places that homogenize it and recontextualize it, looking at it on new devices, this is definitely right. The web is the best place for text, and this is the web. But what's the role of typography now? We're finally beginning to understand John Alsop's prescient list apart article, A Dow of Web Design. And as we get used to the flexibility of the web, it's tempting to believe that the alternative to pixel-perfect control is no control at all. But isn't design about having some kind of influence? Design is a job. Designers are paid for a reason. We make educated decisions about a thing being one way and not some other way. And typography is a big part of design. It matters. Eric Speakerman likes to say that if you have a typeface and a color, you have a brand. Typography is efficient, effective branding. It's also the mark of a professional. As Kevin Kelly famously wrote, the internet is a copy machine. And if everyone can publish, then authenticity is valuable. Typography can reinforce authenticity. And it's also subtle and critical to the understanding of a message. Thomas Finney wrote for uh, Communication Arts a great uh, article where he compares Typography to film editing and camera movement. Presentation is optional on the web, but it's not worthless. It's worth a lot to the meaning of our messages, and as designers, it's our responsibility to fight for its value. There's a military concept called the fog of war, which I know from video games like Warcraft, where parts of the map are blacked out because you haven't been there yet. Designers are experiencing a fog 
of influence. We don't know what's out there. But it doesn't mean we stop fighting, doesn't mean we quit, doesn't mean we stop doing our job and practicing our craft. The web is always changing. Its, it's contexts are only going to get more diverse. We're always going to have that fog of influence. There'll always be things for which we as designers and readers are not prepared. But the web isn't a new medium. It's the evolution of all media. And to design for it, we need to think about typography in a way that's as universal as the web is. At uh, the State University of New York at New Paltz, I learned about graphic design. And I got a job at the publications office on campus. And on the shelf at that job, I found Jeffrey Zeldman's first book. And I've been working on the web ever since, for 10 years. I've seen browsers come and go. I've seen bugs and hacks consume our attention and fade away. And I've seen best practices change. The web is always changing. And what's kept me afloat and employed and interested is to think abstractly but work practically. Work so that the little decisions I make reflect my values and my understanding of the biggest whole that I can grasp. And that's what I want to talk with you about today. I want to look at typography in a very fundamental way to share with you the mental framework I use for interpreting phrases that we see all the time. Where do we start? Sorry. We start with type. This is a, a glyph in, in digital and metal formats. The same things are happening here. The same decisions have to be made about positioning and spacing this glyph within the boundaries, but the boundaries are applied in different ways. Uh, characters are unique symbols. There's only one such thing as an uppercase F, only one such thing as a lowercase F. Glyphs are instances of one or more characters. So an FI ligature represents the characters F and I, and multiple, character, multiple glyphs can represent the same character like a lowercase f and a small cap f, both represent the lowercase f character. We think about type like this as letters, right? And, and historically, type is based on handwriting and marks scratched into stone. It's natural for us to think about type as this black parts of type as the thing a type designer creates. But type designers spend as much or more time thinking about the negative space, the spaces in and between letters. Cyrus Highsmith just wrote a book, Inside Paragraphs. It's great. And in it, he says, don't think about them as layers like ink and paper. Think about the black and the white parts as parts of a puzzle. Garrett Nordze remarked about an example like this one, that on the left, this feels like a, a string of unrelated letters and not a word. But on the right, it's even worse because the letters themselves are being destroyed. So what type designers really do as they're, as they're giving shape and expression to the symbols of our languages is they create balance and rhythm. Matthew Carter said, type is a beautiful group of letters, not a group of beautiful letters. So in type, we account for horizontal taste. But it's not practical for sentences and paragraphs to go on forever in a single line. They have to break somewhere and wrap down to the next line. Where they break and the space between lines is up to us, typographers. Getting this balance right is very important. This is size, letting, and measure in CSS speak, that's font size, line height, and width. And this, luckily, we've been practicing getting this right for a long, long time. In fact, we probably practiced it. You probably resized fluid layouts until a text block felt good, whether you were designing it or just reading it. 
There's no right way to do this, but we do have a lot of experience. This is a traditional formula. It's not new for designers to write code that gets interpreted. Graphic designers used to mark up manuscripts and send them to typesetting shops who would produce to the specification, just like we send instructions to browsers. And practicing typography is about changing the values in this formula and judging the results. You think about things like context. If you have bursts of news in a crammed environment, then you set a narrow text block, a narrow measure. Maybe you use a small font size and a compact typeface so you get more characters per line, a smoother text block. You think about things like what's comfortable for the reader. What are they familiar with? That familiarity is a big deal. Some people don't like novels set in sans serif typefaces because it's just not what they're used to. And of course, you try and make tasteful decisions. At Typekit last year, we took a field trip to M&H Type Foundry, the largest and oldest letterpress type foundry in the United States. And as part of that operation, they have a uh, Arion Press. That's Arion Press and M&H Type Foundry. And at Arion Press, they actually use the type that M&H makes to print books. And while we were on this tour, the guide said to us that they set type to the artist's line, meaning they choose typefaces, set and space them to, so that the line quality and tone matches art in the books. Now, you don't have to be setting an artist's book or working with physical materials to build that same resonance into your work. So size, letting, and measure are related. You might say that we mentally plot a point on a graph like this and then adjust our line height accordingly, right? It's either small to big, narrow to wide, plot your point, and then just adjust the line height, which takes a lot of practice. Just looking at things over and over again, feeling the balance of a typeface out until you get the line height just right for these conditions. And if you change the typeface you're using, you have to reassess these measurements. Different typefaces are sized and spaced differently. So even very similar typefaces can look totally different when they're typeset. And just the way that you wouldn't use the same size, letting, and measure for different fonts, you wouldn't use the same measurements for different elements in a composition. Different parts of a layout have different jobs to do, and they need different solutions. Not every typeface was made for use at heading sizes. Not every typeface was made for use at text sizes. That's why one of the most prominent features of Typekit's browsing UI are these buttons recommended for paragraphs, recommended for headings. It's why Adobe, uh, Adobe, the software company, has as part of it a type foundry. They make Minion, Myriad, Trajan, Garamond Premiere Pro, Adobe Caslon, things you've heard of. What, one of the things they do with a lot of their typefaces is they make these optical styles. So up top here is minion display for use very large. And then minion subhead, and then regular minion, and minion caption. Not every font was made for use in course resolution environments. So the Font Bureau has reading edge typefaces drawn specifically for use at small sizes on course screens. Not every font was made for use at high resolution. I like this tweet of Eric Speakerman's, but one of the things I remember about getting my iPhone 4 with the retina screen is how weird Verdana looked. People had always been saying that about printed out Verdana, but it, that never bothered me. On the retina screen, it, it felt weird. And that kind of makes sense because Matthew Carter designed anti-aliasing fuzz into Verdana. That was part of it. He drew the bitmaps first. So really our graph has a third axis that goes from coarse to fine, low resolution to high resolution. And plotting a point on this graph is a really intuitive process. It really is. If you have something like newspaper, you have coarse paper, 
a narrow text block and a kind of small size. So you might plot something like this. If you have a billboard, big type, uh, but a concise message, so a kind of a narrow text block, and it's a big canvas, so it's effectively high resolution, you could plot that like this. How about a magazine? Nice glossy paper, good size for reading, and maybe it's a wider typeface and you set a nice elegant measure. You might plot that like this. This is how typography has always worked. You think about these conditions, you pick a point, and you set your type, and it doesn't change. Web typography is about picking more than one point. In fact, what we do is determine limits and define a range of acceptable solutions. We, we look at things like uh, using things like CSS, uh, min and max width, rules like that, uh, invoking breakpoints when we have to, inventing behavior with JavaScript. We used to think about typography as a set of fixed decisions, but now we understand it as a continuum of conditional logic. And there are things happening here also that are outside of our control or that are hard for us to see. I wrote a blog post earlier this year at Nice Web Type about breakpoints and range rules. Breakpoints like media query breakpoints, which are those vertical white lines that drop you down to a whole new reality. And the red bars here represent range rules like min and max width. Now, there are parts of this diagram that are just impossible to ever be. Like a text block could, could have a min and max width and never reach its max width because a breakpoint is invoked. We need tools to help us visualize these multi-dimensional decisions that we're already making. But for tools to help us, we need to articulate our needs. And we're just talking about one element. We're still just talking about one element. Multiple elements, each with different typefaces and different jobs in a composition. Each of them have their own chart like this mentally. They all exist in multiple states at once. This is like quantum physics. And we're trying to get it done on deadlines for clients who probably wanted apps anyway. But this is the future. This is what we understand the future to be for our websites and apps. And it's actually not unprecedented. We've been making these decisions for hundreds of years in our minds. And so, if we remember that beneath all this complexity is that simple structural constant type, then it's easier to answer questions like these. We talk a lot about designing in uh, the browser versus Photoshop. One thing's for sure, before you start executing on a design, you should have some goals in mind. Karen McGrain uh, suggests that we focus on specific chunks of content. Ryan Singer says that we should think about interfaces as sets of jobs. One of the simplest decisions you can make about a chunk is what is its job? Is it there for looking at? Is it there to be read? The great discontent is a great example. The top area is meant to catch people's attention. And the lower area is meant to be read. Type in the top area scales with the photograph. Type in the lower section flexes, and font size stays mostly consistent. And that makes sense. When you're reading something, you don't want the font size to change. You want it to be what you expect. But in a display situation, it's very important that type either doesn't break or breaks a certain way and keeps its relationship with other visual elements. Display type is a very different job than text for reading. And making a decision like this, the, the, the job of a chunk, that helps you choose typefaces too. 
Start with body text. Find something that you think will be appropriate for the project you're working on. And then try it out with content that's as close to the real stuff that you'll be using as possible. Because that makes a big difference. The words that are actually, that you're gonna be working with can, the length of words, the frequency of different letters, that changes your opinion of whether a typeface is suitable or not. And then look at it in as many contexts as you can. Fire up Edge Inspect and look at the devices you have with you. Or go to a device lab. This is Williami Selmanen's open device lab in Helsinki. And there's uh, an open device lab just an hour away from here in, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Breda. I made this web font specimen that we can all share in 2009 and I wrote about it for a list apart. It helps, it's, it's critical to see web type in real context before you judge it. And so load this up on all those devices. Examine your typeface. When you look at something like this, you're doing two things at this part of the process. You're just confirming your initial uh, uh, hunch that this typeface is going to be right for your project. And you're also looking for the size at which this particular typeface looks really good. Because different typefaces can like, look different at the same size, the same CSS set size. And that's because inside font files is this thing called the M box. The M, E-M, is a unit of measurement that's originally based on the width of a font's capital M. Uh, it has come to mean in typography and in CSS this bounding box, the M box. Glyphs in a font file sit in this M box. And the M box is what becomes your CSS font size. And it maps to CSS content area. So things like padding and borders and margin are layered on outside that. Different fonts are sized and positioned differently within that M box. So the same font. I mean, a different font at the same set size can look very different. That's why you need to look at those specimens to see what's appropriate for the typeface you're interested in using. So, is everybody with me so far? We've got the jobs of chunks. We've got uh, a body text typeface that we've examined in a lot of contexts. And now we're actually going to start coding. Now, at this part of my process, there's, yeah, I usually have sketches to guide me as I work. Um, and the first thing I want to do is start from a, a, a base that I can trust. A reset style sheet is the very first step for me. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you use Eric Meyer's reset or some other reset, normalize. What matters is that you understand everything that's going on. You don't want to be making decisions about measurement and have browser default styles or uh, rules in a framework that you picked up but you didn't understand all the way monkeying with the measurements that you're making. That's just really frustrating. And knowing exactly what's going on, that's part of web design. It's been that way for a long time. Jeff Fien wrote this in 97. We've learned some things since 97, and we'll continue to learn. Uh, some friends of mine that I used to work with at Vassar College Ray Schwartz, Chris Silverman, and Donnie Trong, we all still talk about best practices in web design, and we recently decided to make the uh, product of some of that discussion uh, public. Everybody could be doing this. We should all be talking about everything that goes into our work and the different options we have and why we prefer one or the other. This is part of typography now. Veterans may remember uh, Richard Rudder's A List Apart article, How to Size Text in CSS, in which Richard advocates a body or a base font size of 100%, followed by M based font sizing for individual elements. That's a good idea. But we've gotten into the habit of changing that root percentage. 
increasing it so that all the text on our site gets a little bigger because that's just what we're getting used to now, bigger type. It's easier to do that than to go through our CSS files and update every M value. But as Scott Gell pointed out, M-based media queries don't listen to that root percentage. It's as if they're always seeing 100%. So if we change that root percentage to anything but 100, then 1M in our media queries doesn't equal 1M in our CSS property values, which is a big problem if you set your media queries based on your typography, which I think everybody should be doing. So this is what we've got, the 100%. And then these, these next two rules are just basic progressive enhancement. It's easy to, when we're working with uh, measurement and getting excited about typography, it, it's easy to forget about people for whom the fonts we intend are never part of the experience. So set, set type generically first, and then follow that up with rules that apply only when the typefaces we intend are present. This WF Active class is part of what we call font events at Typekit. Sean McBride, one of our engineers, wrote a series of blog posts about how to use them. And we serve JavaScript at Typekit, so these are just baked right in. But it's also open source JavaScript that we put out with Google, so you can use it with any service or with fonts you host yourself. And what this tells you is whether a font is inactive or active or is still loading. So now let's talk about sizing and spacing type. Spent a lot of time so far talking about that getting that base font size just right on a solid foundation. But where you go from there, up or down, in terms of sizing other elements, is up to you. You may recognize some of these numbers. They're part of a traditional typographic scale. Based on conventions from when people were working with metal, like Fournier. We don't have to use this scale necessarily. But using a scale, I've found that to be helpful. It, it makes my work look better. And Robert Bringhurst advises us not to start working without a scale. Modular scales, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, there's a chapter in the Elements of Typographic Style that uh, is all about shaping the page and encourages us to uh, make a new scale for every project that we work on. Modular scales were the subject of a talk I gave that Robert mentioned before at Build in 2010 and a follow-up a list apart article that covers the process in a little more detail. Just to sum it up, Modular scales are sets of numbers that are related to one another uh, with a ratio that you can sprinkle throughout a composition to make everything feel proportionally related. You can use this for things like font sizes, and spacing. You can also use it for things like line length limits. Why not have the width of your text block be proportionally related to your type sizes? Another way to uh, set line length is to count characters, which is also another piece of advice from Mr. Bringhurst, who says, as a general rule, 45 to 75 characters is a good idea. So Trent Walton popped a couple of asterisks into a paragraph of dummy text and just throws that into his project and resizes numbers until it looks right. And whether you're working intuitively like this or more mathematically with a scale, what you're trying to do at this stage is determine limits that are acceptable to you. Because you can use that data. If we were setting these two, the 20M and the 30M paragraphs uh, in print, we would use a, a tighter line height for the more narrow paragraph and a looser line height for the wider paragraph because people's eye has to travel longer to get to the beginning of the next line. And on the web, we have to do both. 
and we can. This is a piece of JavaScript called Molten Letting from Matt Marquis, where you take those limits, the minimum and maximum width of a text block, and you associate minimum and maximum line heights with those widths. And at any point in between, you have essentially dynamic fluid line height. And there's an interesting story behind this. I talked about it a little bit with Jeffrey Zeldman on the Big Web Show, um, where a lot of people had an idea for this at kind of the same time. And because we talked about it, it, it is now a real thing. Sharing in our community is really valuable, as I think Simon was talking about earlier. So let's say we have a few of these text blocks stacked up. They're sized the way we want them to be, and uh, they flex within limits that we have determined are acceptable. The simple decisions we've already made and that we will make in this linear layout context, those can be uh, used throughout our compositional continuum. Like, what do horizontal margins look like here? When the text block reaches its maximum width, do the margins continue to grow? How much? When do we invoke a breakpoint? How does this content out thinking relate to container-based grid systems. If a text block reaches its natural limit, but the column in its grid keeps widening, then what, what is it, just centered in that column? Or do you invoke a breakpoint so that that awkwardness never happens? The point is, there are two things going on when we typeset web text. There are the natural behavioral limits of the text itself, and there are these constraints that we apply with containers. And there's no reason those two things can't be in harmony, can't work together. The same decisions about proportion and spacing that we use for sizing type and, and positioning type can be applied throughout our composition in all of its many states. In type, we find extensible balance. Let's talk about display typography. I said a little while ago that it has different goals than body text. Right? You want to keep it locked up a certain way or so that it doesn't break, because that's powerful. And on the web, we have tools like Fit Text from Paravel and Responsive Measure from Josh Brewer that maintain uh, the proportions of a text block, like the measure and the line height, and, and resize it based on the width of its container. And what we want to look for when we're fitting typography to its container, uh, just like we, we have limits on a text block, like width limits, here we have limits too. How uh, big or small can this type get before it becomes unacceptable to us? before the thin parts of letters start to break down, before the big, beefy forms are in, you know, dissonant with our compositional goals, with our emotional goals. This uh, thing on the left here is a project of mine. I'm typesetting some children's stories for my daughters. And up in the green, that the Adventures of Grandfather Frog, H1, uh, that got too thin for me. So at, when, as the composition narrows, I switch to a different typeface, the typeface I'm using for all the body text. And one thing to note here is, is that looks pretty messed up, right? And I know I need to fix this, but I, I wanted to share with you. The reason that that looks a little messed up is because the fit text rules that I applied to that heading are still in effect even though the font has changed. So what are my options here? I could add a different set of fit text rules for when I have a different font in place. Or I could just set that type instead of trying to fit it to its container. 
Whole compositions could have a mix and do of set and fit chunks. And the nature of those chunks can change as context changes. I haven't talked about either of these things yet. And as we go forward into new contexts, one thing that's in our favor, besides this history that we have to lean on, is that new contexts mean new information about readers. Viewports are not canvases. They're information about readers. And as PPK and Scott Kellum have taught us, pixels are also information about readers. We need more of this kind of information. Craig Maud wrote for a list apart about knee, bed, and breakfast. Three viewing distances of a tablet user. That kind of viewing distance is something Mark Bolton calls a sensor. We don't have all the sensors we need yet, but just a few minutes before my talk, uh, I'm sorry, I forget your name, Marco, showed me an example of, he's using the camera of, of his laptop to sense people's faces and change the font size, right? These sensors are coming. We're going to have them. And how will those affect our typography? When, when the digital is indistinguishable from the physical, and we're not limited anymore by the dimensions of a piece of glass in our hand, what will the boundaries of our experiences be like? What will the interactions be like at the edges of those experiences? Will our experiences feel homogenous? Will they conform to the aesthetic of, of a manufacturer of some environment? Or will we have shown the world that design matters? What's our role as pioneers making these decisions and our role as settlers on the frontier who have to live with those pioneering decisions. This is how typography works now. And because the web is the evolution of all media, you know, our decisions will affect readers for generations to come. And they can also bring us closer to our ancestors so that their wisdom can live in not only the way we work, but in our work itself. Because the web is an evolution of all media, and because this is how typography works now, what I'm suggesting is that typography has changed. And it's really exciting to be a part of that. Thank you. <laughs>